Well, good morning, everyone, and Merry Christmas to all of you. Um, I just wanted to say it's, I'm, I'm really glad to be here today. Uh, last Christmas, my family and I, we did not get to be here. Uh, we were in the Northwest in Washington State where I grew up for my grandmother's funeral. So, um, so we did not get to be here for Christmas Sunday or the Christmas Eve service. And so I'm just very excited to get to be here with you Uh, my church family today. Does anybody look forward to Christmas? I look forward to Christmas. Um, I brought a box with me. I didn't wrap it. The reason why I didn't wrap it, and my wife can attest to this, is because my wrapping skills leave something to be desired. I can usually get the box covered, uh, but I use probably three times more paper than is necessary. So I guess I keep the the wrapping paper business going. But I really do. I I look forward to Christmas. There's some gifts that really have meant a lot to me um, down through the years. And do any of you have things like that, gifts that meant a lot to you? Well, I thought I'd share a, a couple of them with you. This is one of them right here. Now, I'm kind of a traditionalist. I don't usually wear, I I, I don't wear a hat in the building or in church, Um, but for the purposes of the sermon this morning, I thought I'd put this on. Now, this probably doesn't mean anything to most of you, right? It looks pretty goofy, but for Lara and I, yes, my wife bought me this hat. Uh, This has a lot of meaning for us because we're kind of nerds, I'll, I'll admit it. And there was a TV show that we liked, and one of the characters wore this hat, and we both thought it was really cool. And so she went and found me a version of the hat. It doesn't mean much to you guys, but I think it's pretty cool. It means a lot to me. Now this little coffee cup here says Samoa Cookhouse on it. Nothing really exciting about that. It's kind of a small coffee cup. I don't usually use this one because I need more coffee. Um, But I mentioned that last Christmas, uh, my family wasn't here because we were in Washington for my grandmother's funeral. And when we were up there at her house, uh, my uncles and my mom, they said, well, is there anything in the house that meant a lot to you that you identified with grandma? And this was one of those things for me. And so this little coffee cup right here, um, I remember growing up as a kid that this was a coffee cup she always used. And so that's something that's very special to me. So I like gifts. I anticipate Christmas. I look forward to it. And even though I'm 29, I, I probably still am a little bit like, a kid at Christmas time. Well, this morning, uh, let's open up our Bibles to Luke chapter 25, or excuse me, Luke chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 25. Now, I know that Luke 2 is that, I mean, that's the great uh, Christmas passage that we read all the time. If you come back to our Christmas Eve service tomorrow, we're going to go through that passage together. But we're going to go just a few verses further in Luke chapter 2 this morning for our passage. Luke 2, 25 through verse 32. Now let me read that. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time where we can gather together as a a church family, many of us with uh, our families here today, and just celebrate your birth, your coming. 
Father, I pray that this would be uh, a special time of celebration for us and that you would speak to us through your word. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So I like presents. I, I like to give presents and I like to get presents. And in the first few verses of this passage this morning, we are introduced to a man named Simeon. Now, Luke doesn't tell us much about him. We don't know his family history. We don't know his occupation. We don't even know what his age was. But we usually assume that by this point, he was a pretty old guy. But what Luke does tell us is that this man was righteous and devout. In other words, he was a lover of God and devoted to following God well. Luke tells us that at some point in Simeon's life, the Holy Spirit revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen Jesus Christ. Now, it's significant that Luke uses the word Christ here. This isn't Jesus' last name. It's a title that means Messiah or anointed one. So when the Holy Spirit revealed to Simeon that he would not die until he had seen the Messiah, Simeon knew that he was waiting to be, what he was waiting to behold was the fulfillment of a promise that had been made thousands of years before. Now you want to talk about anticipation. That is some serious anticipation. Simeon had been promised that he was going to see the original Christmas gift, a gift that his people, the, the Jewish people, had been anxiously waiting for for generations. And here he was, this old man who was going to get to see that promised king before he died. So I want us to look at this passage in a couple of different ways this morning. First, we are going to look at the anticipation that Simeon, Simeon experienced. And we're going to see how it was built up down through the generations by a series of covenants that God entered into with his people. And second, we're going to see how we too should be living in anticipation just like Simeon. It's interesting that at Christmas, we usually talk a lot about joy and we tend to decorate things with bright lights and bright colors. Incidentally, one of those songs that we sang this morning, uh, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. Does anybody know the background to that song? If you look in your hymnal and you see who wrote it, it was a guy named Longfellow. You might remember him from your high school English class. You probably read some of his writings, Longfellow. He was a very, very popular poet and writer in the 19th century, around the Civil War time. And this hymn that we sing on Christmas has to do with the great tragedy that he was experiencing in his life. There's actually a verse that we cut out of the hymnal that makes it very clear that this is a, a song written out of the Civil War days. And his son had been shot and was near death. And his wife before that had been killed in a tragic accident. And so this song that we sing on Christmas Day and so often with, with, with joy is actually tinged with a lot of sadness and heartache. And so that brings me back to, to this, what we're talking about this morning. The roots of Christmas were not so joyful. In fact, the need for the first Christmas, the need for Jesus to come to the earth in the first place, arose out of an act of rebellion, pride, and idolatry. Adam and Eve, the parents of the human race, decided that the perfect world God had given them and the perfect relationship they had with God was not enough. They wanted to be like God, to make themselves gods. So they disobeyed God in an act of cosmic rebellion that would have repercussions right down to the very atomic structure of the universe. The world broke down and is still breaking down. Now, God could have called it quits right there. He could have cut Adam and Eve off and he could have started over. That was certainly within his power. But that's not what God did. The opportunity to rescue humanity from their sin and rebellion gave God the chance to reveal to us aspects of himself and his character that we would not have known otherwise. Things like grace, 
or forgiveness or even wrath and justice. So God puts in place a rescue plan. And he starts this by making a promise. And we often call these promises covenants to help us understand just how serious they are. So all the way back in the beginning of your Bible, turn there with me. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Genesis 3, verse 15. Didn't know we were going to be looking at Genesis in a Christmas sermon, did you? <clears throat> Genesis 3, 15. Here's what it says. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now this is God talking to the serpent here who had just deceived Adam and Eve. And he is making a promise that there is a time coming when someone who was born of a woman would be bruised by the serpent, but that the serpent would ultimately face destruction at his hands. This is something called the Proto-Evangelium, the first proclamation of the gospel, and it happens all the way back in Genesis. Now, this was the first promise God made that looked forward to Jesus, that looked forward to that first Christmas. So you can see that for Simeon, in the second chapter of Luke, this anticipation for him had literally been building since back at the creation, back at the fall. You talk about a lot of anticipation built up over generations. But now there's more than that. Let's move forward in our Bibles a bit to Genesis chapter 12, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 3. We're going to see that there is yet another layer of anticipation built here. You have to remember that Simeon would have known about all these promises. These, these promises, these covenants were ingrained into Jewish culture so that when he is promised by the Holy Spirit that he is going to see the Messiah, he understands that the significance of that moment goes well beyond just him. It stretches back for generations and forward into the future. So let's look at Genesis 12, 1 through 3. <clears throat> now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you... All the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, this is the first of several promises that God makes to Abraham. But we're going to focus on this one because it has a very clear relationship to uh, Simeon and to Luke in the New Testament. <clears throat> At this time, Abraham is still known as Abram because God had not yet changed his name. The name Abraham means the father of many, or the father of many nations. And at this point, Abraham and his wife, they have no children, none whatsoever. In fact, it's looking pretty gloomy that they're going to have any at all. So God comes to this childless man. Think about this for a minute. God comes to this childless man. He's old. It's not looking like he's ever going to have any kids. And he tells Abram that from him all the families of the earth would be blessed. Now, what does that mean? How does that fit in with the anticipation of that first Christmas, the anticipation that Simeon experienced? Well, what God was promising was that from Abraham would come a blessing to the world. We know from the Bible that throughout much of its history, the nation of Israel, which was descended from Abraham, did not do a good job of obeying God and being the blessing to the world that they were intended to be. So Simeon, like the rest of the Jews, were still waiting to see this promise fulfilled. Now, who was the one that was being referred to there in that promise? It was Jesus. It was Jesus. And when it says that in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed, we see a foreshadowing of Jesus and the message of the cross going throughout 
the globe. So Simeon's anticipation was built on this promise that finally, finally, after thousands of years, the Jewish people would be a blessing to the world because of the work of the promised Messiah. Now, we're going to look at one more promise this morning. Earlier I mentioned that Christ was a title for Jesus that means anointed one, anointed one. Now that carries with it connotations of royalty and of kingship. In my mind, it brings up images of David being anointed by Samuel as God's chosen king for the nation of Israel. So it shouldn't surprise us to find that God also made a promise to David that reveals to us something of the royal and kingly nature of Jesus and only adds to the anticipation that Simeon would have felt as he waited for this new king to come on the scene. Turn forward in your Bibles to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel, and we're going to look at chapter 7, verse 16. 2 Samuel, chapter 7, verse 16. Here we find God speaking through his prophet Nathan to King David. Here's what it says, 2 Samuel 7, 16. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Now, we know that nothing in this world is eternal. The mightiest nations rise and they fall. I mean, in the Old Testament, the Egyptian nation was powerful, but ultimately they rise and they fall. At the time of Christ, who was the the powerful nation on the scene? It was the Romans. But ultimately, they fell. And we've seen this all throughout human history where you have powerful countries, powerful nations, powerful kings who rise and they, it seems like they're going to go on forever, but ultimately they all crumble and they all fall. And even here with David, we look at that and we say, well, well, David, he was a good king. And then you have Solomon and then Solomon starts going a little nuts and then everything just goes off the rails after that. And by this point where we are in Luke, the nation of Israel doesn't even really exist as a proper nation anymore. They are a people who are uh, living under Roman rule. There's not even a king anymore. So what does that mean? What does it mean when Nathan says, your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me, your throne shall be established forever? It means that there is someone who is coming from the family line of David who has a kingdom that is not of this world. He has power that is beyond that of any earthly king. He will expand his kingdom, not through the way that you normally think of a king expanding a kingdom through war or trade, but he will expand his kingdom through the hearts of humanity. So as Simeon anticipated that first Christmas, he was not just waiting for a baby, but rather for a promise to be fulfilled that would once again see the throne of David with a king. But this time, this time, no earthly power, including death, could unseat the king from the throne. Now you might be asking, what does Simeon have to do with us today? I mean, you look here in Luke and you see there's just a handful of verses devoted to this man. Seems like a pretty minor character in the grand narrative of Scripture. Well, I don't think we should overlook Simeon. Because in Simeon, we see something being played out that is very applicable to us this Christmas season and every Christmas season. That feeling of anticipation that Simeon had as he waited for the promised Christ child. That feeling of anticipation that was built upon generations and generations of history. That feeling of anticipation made even more palpable in light of the dark world and difficult circumstances that he and the Jewish people were enduring. Because 
They were not living in an easy time. For Christians, there's something really special about Christmas. And it's more than just lights, it's more than just gifts, it's more than just food and family. There's something more than just looking to the past and to a manger 2,000 years ago as well. There's a sense of anticipation. A sense that as we look out at the world and we see the brokenness, we see the violence, we see the darkness, we go, there must be something better coming. And you know what? You're right. There's a second Christmas coming. A day when Jesus will return and make all things right in the world. You see, for us, Christmas is not just a celebration of some past event. It's not just a celebration of Jesus in the manger. It's a celebration of the return of Jesus, the second Christmas as well. Look at Simeon. He was not anticipating something that had already occurred. He was anticipating that first Christmas. Christmas, the initial arrival of Jesus, in which all of those promises would begin to see their fulfillment. So today, we don't just celebrate Christmas as some past event, but with each passing year, as we remember the first Advent, we also anticipate the second Advent. In the book of Revelation, very last book of the Bible, in the very last chapter, chapter 22, verse 7. John penned some of the final words of Scripture. One of the things that he records is the words of Jesus saying, And behold, I am coming soon. So church, as we prepare to leave this place today, as we prepare to take communion and remember the sacrifice of Jesus as we celebrate His coming Let us also remember to live every day like Simeon. Let us read the promise of the second advent that we see there in Revelation when John writes of Jesus, Behold, I am coming soon. Let us see that and say like that great Christmas carol, O come, O come, Emmanuel. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for this time where we celebrate your coming, where our families are gathered together, where we uh, get to enjoy each other's company and fellowship. Father, I ask that you would help us not to just look at this as a reflection of something that happened in the past, but that Christmas would be a time of anticipation for us as we look forward to the second Advent as well. And Lord, I want to just say a special prayer this morning for those of us who have family members who cannot uh, be here with us this Christmas time, whether it be uh, because of work or travel or military service. Father, would you protect those family members uh, as they are away from us? And Father, I ask this morning as we observe communion today that we would remember your broken body and your shed blood even as we celebrate your coming. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.